need for mail and space side systems. For anyone watching who would like to submit a question, you can do so by using the Mars helicopter hashtag. Our phone lines are now open to the media. You can ask a question by pressing star one and enter the queue. To start, I'd like to welcome Thomas Zubukin, who will tell us about the importance of technology demonstrations like Ingenuity. Thanks for getting us started, Thomas. Thanks so much, Raquel. I wanna take you back at 10.30 in the morning on a cool December morning in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. History was made. It took 12 seconds to make history. The first controlled flight here on Earth and something that had huge consequences. And I was thinking about that yesterday as I sat on an airplane from DC to Los Angeles, benefiting from that technology demonstration. We're ready on the surface of Mars. And I wanna bring up that selfie image that we've seen on social media, an image that shows that we're ready for another historic moment, a historic moment the likes of which I believe have analogs in 1903, controlled flight on a different planet. So when I look at this picture, of course I think of the amazing team that got us there. You know, the amazing people here at JPL, you're gonna hear from them. But also the industrial partners that supported us, including Lockheed Martin, for example, to help with the release device. I think of the colleagues in the aeronautics directorate at NASA and then the space tech and the human exploration directorate colleagues that brought instruments onto the Perseverance rover. I think of the team that came together with two words that will always be attached to both of these vehicles. The first one, of course, perseverance, and the second one, ingenuity. Those two words, I think, are, especially as we do this still under COVID times, words that will always be attached to the history of this amazing you know, feat that we're about to attempt. I wanna talk about technology demonstration, and, and if you have paid attention, you may have noticed that we've really added quite a number of technology demonstrations specifically to our portfolio of missions, not just in the science mission directorate, but across the entire agency. Consider, for example, the Psyche spacecraft. And I just wanna tell you, I'm so excited to actually go visit that spacecraft uh, this afternoon next door to here, together with the principal investigator who has never seen it. And, uh, and of course, the reason I'm talking about Psyche is uh, that this amazing mission to this uh, asteroid Psyche, this potential meta world out there. I wanna talk about the deep space optical communication system that space tech is funding that's on top of it, allowing us to test the ability of getting high bandwidth communication all the way from Mars distances to the Earth. I wanna talk about next the chronograph on board the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, which is a technology demonstration also developed here to prove a technology to allow us to kind of image or kind of detect, you know, worlds, exoplanets at brightnesses that are 20 million times weaker than the star in the middle, allowing us potentially to open up new ways of investigating these worlds as we're searching for other planets like our Earth or planets that the likes of which we have no analogs of right here in the solar system. Other directorates have also done technology demonstrations and I wanna talk about two of them that will go with the uncrewed Artemis mission. The first one is the lunar flashlight, a CubeSat that will look for water, especially frozen water uh, at at the moon and help guide human exploration and robotic exploration on, our, on this uh, world next to us. The near-Earth asteroid scout, which is another CubeSat will go, will, with uh, this uh, entire Artemis mission, will look for asteroids that we could explore robotically and perhaps 
with humans in the future with novel propulsion technologies that it's going to demonstrate. And the final technology demonstration I want to talk to you about today uh, looks like this little plane, but it's the Maxwell aircraft uh, demonstrating electric flight in novel ways of integrating that propulsion technology and approving it and really moving us towards net zero emission flight, a transformative change to all of technologies that, of course, we are enabling us uh, to, to travel across the country and around the world. So these are some uh, technology demonstration of many that are there that give us this high risk, high reward time, opportunity to really change the trajectory of what's possible, just like we, had, we wanna see Ingenuity do in the next uh, couple of days. And uh, I'm so excited now to uh, turn it over to uh, Mimi Ang, who is, uh, of course, has been the inspiring leader of Ingenuity. And I just really look forward uh, to hearing uh, from you now, Mimi. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Well, the moment that our team has been waiting for is almost here, Sunday, the first flight. You know, each world gets only one first flight. So as Thomas mentioned, the Wright brothers achieved the first flight on Earth. Ingenuity is poised to go for being the first for Mars. It's gonna be a flight experiment. Flight experiments are as old as flying, right? So the Wright brothers, uh, first successful control flight, uh, powered control flight, was a flight experiment. Uh, next picture, please. Everybody is familiar with this uh, picture. And uh, that was uh, Wilbur Wright uh, performing this flight successfully on December 17th, 1903. Few people know that that wasn't his first attempt. So in the next picture showing not successful flight, uh, that was taken uh, in on December 14th, three days before in 1903. And the Wright brothers did not succeed. Well, history tells us that uh, the uh, uh, Orville and Wilbur took this setback as like true engineers, went back, looked at the data, reviewed the data, confirmed that their fundamental understanding of flying was correct, make the tweaks, went for it again, and succeeded. I love this picture because it's truly a flight experiment. And in fact, um, that night uh, after the failure, uh, Wilbur wrote that there is now no question of final success. So they knew, he knew that they had nailed the fundamental understanding. And, you know, we have to test, to advance. And that is what uh, building first-of-a-kind systems and flight experiments are all about. Design, test, learn from the design, adjust the design, test, repeat until success. And so, uh, same with Ingenuity, Mars helicopter. We started with the fundamental question, really serious question of, is it really possible, whether it's possible to fly a helicopter on Mars? And it's challenging for many different reasons. For it, most important of all, the atmosphere at Mars is extremely thin, right? It's 1% compared to the atmosphere we have on Earth. And it is very cold at night. The vehicle we send there has to survive cold nights on its own. It has to charge itself. And the winds are new to us. On top of it all, this flight experiment that we are performing at Mars has to be operated from back here on Earth. All right, so we took on we start with the analysis that showed how much we can lift, and then we took systematic, incremental design, test, and feed in to the next level of designing and tests. And from showing the capability of lift with a prototype vehicle in simulated Mars atmospheric um, you know, uh, environment in the 25-foot chamber here at JPL, uh, we showed lift. From then on, we went to show that we can build, uh, we, we demonstrated first full flight controlled, uh, control flight, power flight in our chamber in 2016. We went on to then develop the full up model that is needed, full the system to need to fly a test at Mars. And that's, we call it the engineering development model. We demonstrated full success test flight. We flew it successfully in our chamber in 2018 and then we built Ingenuity. 
uh, which we flew in our chamber in uh, 2019. So this is the result. The picture you see is a close-up photo of uh, Ingenuity Mars helicopter taken very shortly before we packed it to be shipped to Florida to be integrated onto Perseverance rover. Thomas, actually, you were in the lab visiting us the day this photo was taken. So this is one of my four favorite pictures uh, on this, um, on this uh, project. So this little four pound vehicle, the vehicle that you're seeing is four pound, to date, as we speak, has been surviving on its own. The cold nights, the temperatures there get down to minus 90 degrees centigrade, like minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit. It's been surviving on its own. It has been successfully charging. It's recharging its battery during the day. It has been communicating to its base station that resides on the rover, ultimately exchanging information with us. And we have fully confirmed that it has enough energy and power to perform this flight at Mars. And the flight at Mars is high power. Peak powers exceed 350 watts. So the vehicle is set. And the last time Ingenuity flew was here at J JPL in the 25-foot chamber with us, with our team. And at that time, we said, you know, next time Ingenuity flies, it will be at Mars. Next, please. Next is a picture of our team. Oh, there it is uh, at Mars. You see it? <laughs> On its own little four pounder. And next please. It's a picture of the helicopter team. Now, not everybody could make to this photo session. It's a large team and across the country. Here, a team at JPL, uh, NASA Ames, NASA Langley, our industrial partners, AeroVironment, Qualcomm, Solero, Lockheed, others. And we are really proud to have achieved to where we are at this moment, and we're looking forward to our first flight attempt on Sunday. So on behalf of our whole team, um, Thomas, I'd like to thank NASA um, and every home org organization for letting us dare mighty things, and in this case, daring to fly on another planet. Really, thank you. And now, uh, recapping the, t the, the goals of the Mars helicopter technology demonstration is to meet uh, NASA's agency level objectives. And there are three. The first is to demonstrate on Earth that it is possible to fly a controlled power flight on Mars. And we have done that. And the second objective we have is to actually fly at Mars. We're within d a few days of doing that. And third is to return data to inform engineers developing the future generations of helicopters for Mars. We have started receiving data, and so far so good and we're looking forward to the data coming out. So now turning our attention to the first flight attempt on Sunday. So up to now, we have been talking to Ingenuity every day since Ingenuity was dropped perfectly by Perseverance rover to the surface. Um, and um, we have checked out Ingenuity's en uh, energy profile, very healthy, very good, we're happy. The thermal models have been checked out. The sensors have been turned on, computers are on, operating well. Our rotor, the blades have been released, and we have finished testing the rotor operating low speed spin at 50 RPM. So we have one uh, final checkout test, and that's scheduled for today, and that's to spin it full speed, uh, spin the rotors full speed to the flight RPM. And uh, after that, uh, we will be set to go. So, so far, so good, knock on wood. So um, we have chosen uh, the time of the first flight to be 12.30 p.m. Mars local time, and this time is picked uh, between assessment of wind conditions and uh, assessment of having sufficient energy and power for ingenuity to perform a robust flight. So in parallel, we have been communicating with the META team on the w Mars, uh, weather at Mars. Uh, META is the weather instrument on the Perseverance rover, Initial uh, metadata indicates that we could uh, encounter winds um, higher than uh, what we were able to test on Earth, but there's also probability it could be less than what we tested on Earth. Yeah, there's uncertainty in the predicted range, but our simulations uh, show that we are able to, uh, the system, the closed-loop controlled flight system is resilient to this range of winds. 
But that's an example of exactly why we are testing at Mars, performing this flight experiment. So uh, we have carefully designed, we have carefully tested on Earth, we have been checking out carefully on Mars up to now, and it's time to attempt the first flight, and we will test, prove, and learn, regardless of what the outcome is uh, in this first attempt. So for um, Sunday, there are four possible outcomes. The first is full success. Second, partial success. Third could be insufficient or no data coming back, which means we'll have to take more time to figure out what's happened. Or it could be failure. Uh, so please join us. And regardless, we will learn whether it's success, failure, interim. But one thing is for sure. You know, we have done everything we can, and if we don't make the first attempt, for sure we will not make progress forward. So with that, to describe more of what's coming up, I'd like to hand it over to Tim Canham. Well, thank you, Mimi, and the team, of course, is very excited to be looking forward to this first flight. You know, we've has, we have spent the last year planning and practicing and, and uh, understanding what we need to do to do the first flight, and of course, the team was very excited for Perseverance gently landing us on the surface. We looked for a site which thankfully was only 20 or 30 meters away from the Octavia Butler landing site. And we've since we've dropped, we've been working our way through these commissioning activities to check out the helicopter, to do some calisthenics, to make sure all the all the motors and blades and computers are working, as Mimi mentioned. And so finally we're reaching that culmination of all of that testing and the helicopter is good, it's looking healthy. We're very excited that the energy levels are where they need to be to fly. And we're, we're finishing off these last commissioning activities. And last night, we did our 50 RPM spin where we spun the blades very slowly and carefully and exercised the servos to control the angle of the blades. And that was very successful. And we have here a quick video that the MassCam Z took of, those, of the helicopter spinning in the distance. So from there, the rover was about 40 meters away. And so we're able to look at the telemetry in very good detail and verify that the, the blades moved and the, and the blades spun as expected, and it looks very good. So what's it gonna be when we fly? So the flight, as Mimi mentioned, will happen at 12.30 in the afternoon on Mars time, which will be about 8 p.m. on Earth time on Sunday. And then later on in the evening, the data will be relayed back to Earth by the Perseverance rover through an orbiter, and then we will be waiting here in the control centers at NASA for that data to come in. We're expecting that data around 12 midnight, early Monday morning. And so what's the first flight gonna be? It's gonna be a very careful flight just to do the very first checkout because it'll be our first flight. And we're gonna, we're gonna lift off, we're gonna go up to about three meters, we're gonna rotate in the direction of the rover and we are gonna take a picture and then we're gonna settle back down. The whole flight from the moment the blades spin up until we land again will be about 40 seconds worth of time. That's the time we felt safe doing it on our first flight given the energy levels that we're seeing and we wanna make the very first flight a safe one. As you can see in the accompanying animation, that's what the flight will look like. So one of the nice things about the helicopter is that it has cameras on board and we have a downward pointing black and white camera that we use to do our navigation. It's fused with other sensors like an inertial guidance sensor and an altimeter. And as we're flying, we're taking pictures 30 times a second of the surface and the software is detecting features. And then as the helicopter moves, those features move with it and the helicopter can do an estimate of what those what the rate and direction of the helicopter motion is. So that black and white camera is our primary camera that we use for navigation. Here is a picture that we took downward facing on the day that we dropped. And you can see it's slightly overexposed, but we, we've been tuning it over the last few saws to get better pictures. But that's really the view, what the helicopter is gonna see while it's flying. And it'll pick out those features on the ground, the rocks. That was one of the reasons we selected this terrain is because the features are very nice for that feature tracking. So as those features drift, the software can detect those dri that drift. Secondly, we have a 13 megapixel color camera that's pointing towards the horizon. And that picture will take a few of those pictures during each flight so that we'll get a live 
picture as we're aloft. And here's a picture underneath the rover on the day that we dropped. Now there was a picture that went out that was a low resolution version of this picture, but in the meantime, we've been able to retrieve the high full glory 13 megapixel picture. And that will be out on the NASA website soon. So this is kind of an idea of what, what kind of resolution that we'll get from those pictures as we take them. So what will we be doing the night of the flight when the data comes in? We have our downlink team that will be watching carefully as that relay happens from the rover through the MRO orbiter back to Earth. We'll see the data show up in the data center and then our downlink engineers will start to decode all that data. And the first thing we wanna do is to verify that we got the data correctly. And at that point, once we confirm that the data has arrived, we will turn it over to Hovard Grip, who was our chief pilot, and he will look for very specific events in that data that indicate that the helicopter took off, did the hover, did the rotation, and then came back down and landed successfully. So that's the first thing we'll look at. And then what we'll do is we'll jump to our, our altimeter data. We have a laser altimeter and we'll do a plot of that altimeter data to see that we rose, hovered, and then came back down. And at that point, we'll be able to confirm, yes, we did really take off. And we'll be able to then look at images, that black and white navigation camera that I mentioned. It will be taking these downward pictures and we'll be taking some images as we come down that help us check for sure where we landed. And so we'll be able to see that on the day of the flight. The color camera pictures that I mentioned, we will be downlinking them the day after the flight. So we're very, we'll be very excited to see what kind of picture was taken during that flight time. Once you've seen the altimeter and the helicopter team is super excited because we've confirmed that we did that first flight, then we should be able to see some imagery from the rover itself. The rover is gonna use that magnificent Z-CAM instrument to attempt to take video during the flight. We've been practicing that over the last few SALs with the blade release and the 50 RPM spin to try to synchronize our timing. And so far it's gone really, really well. So we thank the MassCam Z team for that. And so on the day of the flight, when we're downlinking that data, once we confirm that we flew via that altimeter data, then we can turn it over to the rover team and see what kind of imagery they got for the actual flight from the rover itself. So we're really excited. It could be an amazing day. We're all nervous but we have confidence that we've put in the work and the time and we have the right people to do the job. And so at this time, I wanna turn it over to Amy Kwan and she can give some history on how we actually tested the helicopter for this momentous moment. So my job as the test conductor for the Mars helicopter was to make Mars on Earth and enough of it so that we could actually fly our helicopter in it. We needed to test ingenuity because it's very difficult to fly on Mars. The main reason is that the atmosphere is very, very thin. It's about 1% of the density of Earth's atmosphere at sea level. Um, that's the equivalent of about 100,000 feet of altitude on Earth or three times the height of Mount Everest. Um, we don't generally fly things that high. Commercial airliners fly at about 35,000 feet. The Earth record for helicopter altitude is about 41,000 feet. And there were some people who doubted we, had to, we could generate enough lift to fly in that thin Martian atmosphere. Now, Mars has less gravity than Earth, but that's not really enough to counteract the effects of that thin atmosphere. So we needed to simulate that environment on Earth to prove to ourselves and others that we could generate enough lift to fly on Mars. We conducted a battery of tests over the course of five years, starting in 2014. Um, we started by showing that lift is possible and then we moved on to showing that we could have controlled autonomous flight um, with increasingly light development uh, models before we moved on to uh, testing our flight model, which is the helicopter that's currently on the surface of Mars. And wow, that's really amazing to say. Um, for simulating Mars on Earth, we were using our 25-foot space simulator, a thermal vacuum chamber that we have here at JPL. This is a chamber that we run all of our spacecraft through before we send them off into space. For instance, uh, both Curiosity and Perseverance went through this chamber on their way to Mars, and the Voyagers went through this chamber on their way out of the solar system. Um, so for our first flight in 2014, we put a small helicopter prototype in the chamber, sucked all the air out, 
added a little bit of carbon dioxide back to simulate that Mars-like atmosphere. So on Mars, the atmosphere is mostly, cons uh, mostly consists of carbon dioxide, whereas on Earth, it's mostly consisting of nitrogen. Uh, for that first proof of concept in 2014, that was our first time attempting to fly in that Mars atmosphere. We were using an ex experienced helicopter pilot to directly control the helicopter. In the video, you will be able to see that we were able to hop around. Uh, video, please. So hop, hop, and then rapid unscheduled disassembly. Now, that may look like a failure, but similar to Wilbur Wright's uh, failed flights back at Kitty Hawk, we learned a whole lot. And the biggest thing we learned was that we can generate sufficient lift and we actually can fly on Mars. Granted, we need to spin the rotors much faster than a helicopter on Earth would to generate that lift, but we can do it. The other thing we learned is that because of that thin atmosphere, things happen too quickly for a human pilot to be able to react in time. Think about it like if you were driving your car and you turn the steering wheel the tiniest bit to stay in your lane and suddenly your car was doing donuts. So between that and the potential distance between Earth and Mars, which means that there is a time delay between when you send an, a command on Earth and when it's received on Mars, uh, we decided that this helicopter needed to be able to fly on its own. That means we could upload a given flight profile to it um, and then we tell it to go, but then it would have to do everything else on its own. So by 2018, we had incorporated all the data from the previous tests into testing this engineering model in our vacuum chamber. Um, can I get this video, please? You'll see that the helicopter spins up, climbs, turns, and translates all on its own. Here we have the climb to that one meter height before we turn around and then do our translation. And then by 2019, we took all the data from all our prior flights and tested the helicopter that's now on Mars. This is video from that, from that test. What you may notice is there's a string coming from the top of the helicopter. We use that to mimic gravity on Mars. So it's giving the helicopter just a slight boost so that the rotors are only lifting the Mars weight of that helicopter. Think about it like if you're helping a child on the playground cross the monkey bars and they can't quite hold on. You're, holding, you're just giving them a slight little boost. To successfully conduct these tests, the helicopter team had to predict how the helicopter would behave in that Martian atmosphere. Over the course of the test campaigns, the predictions got better and better based on the data from the prior tests. And we're looking forward to all the flight data coming back from Mars this weekend to tell us how accurate were our predictions and models. For instance, if we told the helicopter to climb at a certain rate, how fast did it actually climb? We'll use that to refine the models that we can put into future aerial vehicles for Mars. So in addition to that flight data coming back, we're also really excited about the possibility of getting images of Ingenuity in flight on Mars. And Elsa Jensen will tell us about uh, the, the images that the rover is going to be taking. Elsa? Thank you, Amy. It gives me the chill sitting here and thinking about the fact that on Sunday, my team and I are going to be taking images and video of you guys flying on Mars. It is such a privilege to be here. We are delighted to be supporting this courageous and inventive team. And um, our perspective really is that from the rover of sitting atop the mast with the mast cam Z cameras and looking at the ingenuity taking off for flight. So I'm part of a small team from Malin Space Science Systems in San Diego. And we operate the MassCam Z cameras. And um, we are really part of a bigger team for the MassCam Z science team that spans worldwide and is led by Jim Bell at Arizona State University. Then, of course, we are part of this whole rover team. There is 10 instruments on the rover. And getting all those instruments, the full rover, and the helicopter to Mars has been a huge team effort, as you can imagine. So um, the, the part that we're really providing here is looking from our perch two meters above, six feet up, and at the Ingenuity helicopter that is 65 meters away on Sunday. We're just getting there just about now, and 
will be in a safe distance to support and record this flight. So we just couldn't be more delighted. Um, if I could have the first graphic, please. This, um, this is a selfie. And uh, what I love about this is that we can see the rover and the engineered helicopter next to each other. You can really see their relationship on Mars. This is when they're five meters apart. And you can see the, the ingenuity helicopter is there. It's about, it's about half a meter or 20 inches tall. And we're close together as this selfie is being taken. The other thing I love about this um, selfie is that it was actually taken with our sister cameras at the end of the arm. That's what you don't see in this image because it's a selfie. Um, but that's a camera on the Watson cameras on the Sherlock instrument. And we built and operate that from um, Mail and Space Science Systems in San Diego as well to support the Sherlock PI here at JPL. It's Luther Beagle. And we work very closely together, our two teams, um, along with the Ingenuity team and along with the other science teams and the rover teams here at JPL. Every day we've been operating on Mars now for 30 days, and it's this whole choreographed dance that we do together, um, and it's a privilege to be a part of. Um, it is, of course, a big team, and it took us years to get here to be ready for Sunday. And what I love about that is that we get to learn so much from each other, and we're planning and overcoming challenges. And some of the things we had to do to prepare for Sunday was really take this high resolution camera, you've seen the big panoramas, we generate so much data. But when you take a video, you have to figure out how do I get that kind of data throughput and still take it seven, six to seven images per second. And how do I do that in the same camera that's doing these magnificent panoramas? So we had to make some hard choices. We had our systems engineer, Mike Kaplinger, who was just figuring out how to eke out every performance that we could from this camera. And then when we came up with command sequences, that's my team's job, those would be tested in the test bed here at JPL by Kim Saxon, our instrument engineer, who spent many nights and weekends in the test bed. And um, that allowed us to learn, as Amy was explaining, what not to do and also what to do. So if I could have the next graphic, please. This is um, starting to set up what we can expect on Sunday. So this is a computer made graphic, right? This is what we simulate before we actually take the images and the videos. So what we're looking for is figuring out, okay, is this gonna work? What you see here is a um, little bit of the rover in the foreground, and we're looking out towards Ingenuity, these 65 meters or 200 feet away. And it looks, this red frame that you're seeing is the actual framing of the picture of the video that we'll be taking. And we're making sure, of course, that Ingenuity is in it. What you probably can't see here is that there's a tiny helicopter in there, little graphic of it. and. Um, what we want to make sure of is that we catch the flight. Remember how Tim was explaining how they're going to go up three feet, uh, three meters, of course, um, about 10 feet up into the air. So we want to make sure we can catch that into our video. Um, but as you can see, when you're looking from the rover, it's going to be pretty small. Let's zoom in and see what we can see. Here you go. Now, imagine this red frame again is what we're actually capturing in our video. Imagine that on your computer screen. Do you think you can see the helicopter? Can you find it there? Well, we'll see on Sunday. Check it out. Um, as you can see, one of the other aspects of, of planning this is that the helicopter is not actually in the middle of the picture because we're expecting it to take flight. So these are the other details that we've been working out with the Ingenuity team. Um, we had to, like I was explaining, we have to really eke out the, the biggest performance we can from these cameras. It's kind of like taking a bucket of water and you're trying to drink, drink from it with a straw. We have just a little bit of downlink compared to the amount of data that we can generate, even in this five minute video that we'll be taking. 
Um, there's no way we could get it down on the ground. It would take us months if we did it at the same resolution and the same sharpness that we take our usual images that you're used to seeing from the mass cam Z cameras. So we had to get pretty creative. Um, we're trying to get seven pictures a second. That's our highest rate of video. And that's what we'll be doing on Sunday. So we had to subframe it. We had to take just part of the frame, about half the frame. Then we had to compress it really hard. Ooh, we don't like compression. We like to see all the details, but we have to do that for this. Otherwise, it just won't work. Um, and then another thing that we have to do is um, think about the, the um, amount of data we can get. So it would be nice to get the whole entire video down right away, but we don't have the downlink for that. So especially on Sunday, or rather Monday morning, as we're getting them really early Monday morning, um, think about the fact that we had to select a priori before even seeing the images from Mars. We had to select which video frames to pick and choose in the blind so that we could get just a few of them on Monday morning. So we get to pick about six frames out of a five minute span. They're little two and a half second snippets. And we did it for the first time last night, actually. And what Tim showed you was one of the examples uh, from the spin test. And of the six frames that we guessed, two of them hit the jackpot. So um, that's all we can do because we have about 20 seconds between our guesses. That's what we're doing so that we can span more time. Um, so we were just ecstatic that we actually hit the jackpot the first time. Now, on Sunday, like Mimi and Amy were explaining, we're going to um, do our very best to do the same predicting. Um, and hopefully, you'll see a few snippets. Regardless of whether we hit the jackpot that first time, we'll definitely get some images. And um, we'll also, over the next couple of days, we'll get all of the video down. We'll get it first in lower resolution and then in higher resolution. Um, so what I want you to imagine also is that we actually have two different ways of taking video at the same time. So this image here, which actually this mosaic was created just last night with the images that came in by Jim Bell and um, RPI. And he made a mosaic of this. It's actually a mosaic. You can't see it because it's very well done. But this is kind of the close-up view. This is our highest resolution camera. This is the most zoomed in with the zoom cameras we can do. And we're doing that with the left camera when we're taking the video. And that's great. You know, we'll see as much detail as we can with the compression that I mentioned, so keep that in mind. But ingenuity will actually fly right out of the frame if we only took images like this. So with the other camera, the right camera, if I can have the next graphic, please. So compare those two images and see that then the right camera would look at this. We're having the most zoomed out view that we can. Um, it's going to be with a 34 millimeter zoom level. And so one is at 110 and one is at 34 millimeters. And we're taking those simultaneously so that with this more zoomed out view, we won't see as much detail, but we will hopefully, that's our prediction, is that we'll catch the whole flight with just the one frame. It would be nice if we could track it with the, with the antenna, but we're not allowed to do that because there could be interference between the different components if we did that. So we're going to stay completely safe. We are going to have a zoomed out and a zoomed in view. And then the first downlink we're going to do, like I said, we're going to try to hit the jackpot with our best estimate of how to catch just a little bit of the zoomed out view. We thought that would be best because if, if it's already flying as we're catching it, we could um, have the best chance of giving you some great video on Sunday, Monday morning. All right. So um, just want to set expectations. This is really hard. We have practiced it, like Tim explained. Um, between the Heli team and the Mass Chem Z team and the Rover team, we've been um, doing really well in these tests this week, actually. So we hope everything will um, go well on Sunday. But we know there'll be surprises. That's what we train for. That's what we test for. There will be surprises. And you will be learning about them right at the same time that we will. 
So let's all get the popcorn, sit in front of our seats on Sunday, Monday morning, and let's see Ingenuity take flight. I'm so excited. We're just delighted to be here with you. Thank you for having us come along. We're going to be there supporting you from the rover. Big sisters watching. And uh, let's go flight. Back to you, Raquel. Thank you, Elsa. And thank you to our panelists. We are now ready to take media questions. Remember to press star one to get put in the queue. And please direct your questions to one of the panelists. And we're also taking questions through the Mars helicopter hashtag. Up first on the phone lines is Chris Davenport with the Washington Post. Hey guys, thanks for taking my question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, I wonder if someone there, maybe uh, Mimi or Tim, can just talk about the rotor blades specifically and how they're able to generate uh, lift in that thin Martian atmosphere. I'm curious how long each of the four blades are and also, how does the counter rotation work to um, allow lift? And then just generally, how big of a challenge is it to fly a vehicle given the thin Martian atmosphere? Thanks so much. Sure, uh, I can take the first cut at this. So yeah, the blades are uh, 1.2 meter tip to tip, <clears throat> and they are two pairs, right, counter rotating. And the blade uh, itself, the shape, the, the blade distribution, the core distribution, the twist is carefully modeled. So the cross section is the airfoil uh, that was uh, adopted uh, from Air Environments, a high altitude aircraft vehicle there on our team. We took that cross uh, cut airfoil and then it was optimized in terms of how the blade would be shaped by uh, CFD analysis and simulations at Ames and Langley. And then that blade uh, was analyzed actually in about 32 analytical slices. And the lift and the drag was modeled for each of those pieces and integrated and then simulated how the vehicle would react when you spin such a blade, you know, and we, so it was really optimized. Taking from that dynamic prediction of how the vehicle would react when you spin, then Havad Grips, the JPL team, um, came back and then designed a closed loop control system around it to make sure that we sample fast enough and send the controls back to control the blade uh, pitch fast enough. Like it turns out it takes hundreds, about four, 500 times per second to uh, design the closed loop control. So yes, absolutely, those blades are not uh, <laughs> something off the shelf, really fine, well, fine tuned to maximize the lift that we can generate in such a thin atmosphere. And one of the things that we did learn right off the bat, as you saw in the video that Amy showed, was the dynamics of spinning a blade in this thin atmosphere of Mars, this uh, Reynolds numbers and Mach number pair, right, so very specific to Mars, the reaction is very different from what we get on Earth. Great, thank you. And up next, we have Marina Corin from The Atlantic. Hi, everybody. Um, this is a question, I think, for Mimi or Tim. Um, so once you've reached the end of your month of operations and perseverance drives away, what happens to ingenuity? And by that, I mean, will it technically be functional because it can still charge itself? How long can it remain technically alive on the surface? And has anyone considered having Percy return to visit Ingenuity someday? Oh, uh, I'll take this. The Ingenuity is a solar powered vehicle. So therefore there, there are no consumables that can run out, so to speak. So that, that's one fact. But in, Ingenuity is also, it doesn't have a self riding system. So if we do have a bad landing, uh, that will be the end of mission. So uh, our estimate is that the lifetime will be determined by how well it lands pretty much. So we have 30 valuable days uh, to do these experiment at Mars and we are going to be, as Tim described, uh, taking a very conservative flight to really nail the first flight. And after that, we'll be taking bolder and bolder flights. We'll be going higher, further, and in fact, uh, by, th by the fifth flight, if we get there that far, uh, we are going to take very bold flights and uh, take high risk. And probabilities are we, uh, it would be unlikely to land safely because we'll start going into unsurveyed areas. Um, and, and after that, after 30 days, uh, even if ingenuity is surviving, you know, this increasing risk that we do plan to take because we want to stretch and understand the capability of this little vehicle, uh, even if it survived, is uh, we are going to turn back the key uh, back to uh, the rover team. Uh, Ken Farley, our project scientist for Perseverance, has been so generous 
uh, gave us 30 invaluable days on Mars, and we will, um, you know, engineered uh, perseverance really must go on to the primary mission that they are on. So that's the plan. Thomas, would you also like to answer yeah. the question? I just wanted to add kind of uh, the, the, the view on this, that, and it very much in support of what Mimi just said. Uh, I just want to go back to Sojourner and remind everybody that uh, Sojourner also was a tech demonstration. A tech demonstration, by the way, without which we could not imagine perseverance. We could not imagine more sample return, which was really uh, pioneered with this. And uh, for me, uh, you know, what Zoe Turner did, did exactly what Mimi just said, which is if you want aggressively punch out the space in which it can operate, taking risks, successively larger risks, and the month of ingenuity will really be a demonstration of the capability that is there and leading to, uh, to the very uh, success, I think, in the long run that Sojourner has, a success that at the time of Sojourner, of course, was not imagined that we could be sitting here with perseverance there on Mars sample return. Can you only imagine what will happen after this month of ingenuity just two decades from now or one decade from now? Thank you for your answers. Up next is Elizabeth Howell from space.com. Hi, everyone. I think this question is for Mimi. If and when you get those first views from ingenuity and perseverance of the flight, what kind of feelings will it evoke in you? And also, are you planning to use Percy's microphones to record audio of the flight? All right, um, I'll give the first part and I am going to have Tim Canham also jump in. So the, the image is, uh, uh, it will be inspiring. It's really hard to imagine uh, you know, how I'm gonna feel because our team, to be frank, has never let ourselves celebrate fully uh, because we've been waiting for really this first flight on Mars. So I believe I'll be really excited to see. First and foremost, probably I'll be more excited about the black and white camera image uh, because uh, to me and a lot of majority of the team, you know, most all of the team, it's about this engineering technology demonstration and getting back that engineering data on how well did it fly because to me, it is about the future. It is about adding that aero dimension and do we model right? Is our analysis right? And more importantly, did we overlook anything and what do we learn? How differently did it fly over there? So the, for me, the black and white picture is gonna be invaluable coupled with the IMU data, altimeter data, and the inclinometer data all combined and how do we fly? Uh, and the color picture is going to be icing on the cake. So Tim, you wanna chime in a little bit about how you're gonna feel about seeing those camera images? Yeah, well, naturally the team is working really hard to be ready for this moment. And so when we see that the data from that first flight and it works, it'll be an incredible moment, the culmination of all this work and all the hopes that we've put into it. And yes, Mimi's right. The primary purpose of this project is to get that detailed engineering data that we can see the performance of the vehicle and then that data can be used by future projects to make even bigger and better helicopters. But at the same time, getting a color image while in flight will be exciting or from an outreach point of view. People will get to get that aerial view of what the helicopter is seeing and it'll, it'll be amazing. You've seen that picture that we've had out. Can you imagine that picture being that nice 13 megapixel picture? We're seeing the dirt right now in essence, but as we go aloft to three meters and then eventually to five meters, getting that panoramic view of Mars from 15 meters up will be amazing. And there was a question about the microphone. Supercam, the instrument has a microphone and we're not gonna do it on the first flight, but we're in discussions about subsequent flights, maybe using that camera microphone to point near, near where the helicopter is and try and get some audio. It's very touch and go as to whether we would even hear anything at that distance. But uh, as I said, discussions are ongoing. We might give it a try. Worst, worst comes to worst, we'll get a lot of nothing, but who knows, maybe we'll catch the sound of the helicopter lifting off. Great, thanks, Tim, and thank you, Mimi. Up next is Paul Brinkman with UPI. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, I, just a, a little bit more about the images. Um, so I guess this question is for Elsa Jensen, but um, how do the uh, how do the helicopter and the rover transmit images? Um, do they they communicate with each other back and forth, and what is that link like? And then um, do we do I understand correctly that at the early morning press conferences we're only going to have black and white images? Is that correct? Great questions. 
There's actually two parts to what you're asking. So the part that we're doing from the MassCam Z side, you know, again, perched up at the top of the rover, we're going to be looking with our MassCam Z cameras. They're in color. We're going to use the color filters, the RGB for that. So all of our images and our video will be in color. Now, that imagery will be sent from the rover to the orbiter, back to Earth. So there's that whole path. And then the other part of what you're asking, I'll pass on to Tim, because that has to do with the images coming from Ingenuity. And the helicopter team is taking those images. So Tim, do you want to address that part? Sure. And we, in many ways, we follow a sim similar path as MassCam Z. The helicopter does its flights, and it's taking this detailed data during the flight, and then we land. But right after the flight, we're gonna, we have used up a lot of our battery energy, so we don't have a lot of excess energy to spend time transmitting the data back to the rover. And so on that first uh, transmission day, the first downlink day, we're gonna concentrate on getting back that detailed engineering data so that the team can analyze what happened. And part of that engineering data is that black and white downward pointing uh, camera, because that's used by the team to relocalize the helicopter to figure out exactly where it landed. But the data follows a very similar path in that the helicopter has a radio link back to the rover. We have our uh, helicopter base station on the rover, which has its own storage. And then that storage gets copied back to the rover and then sent down to Earth. So on that first saw, we're going to transmit those, uh, those black and white images. We're going to get summary data of the flight. We don't have, again, the time to transmit on the radio, the very detailed logs of the flight. And then we're going to let the helicopter go to sleep and recharge its batteries. On the following sol, that's when we're going to wake the helicopter back up and we're going to transmit that color image back to the rover for downlink to Earth. So that's the first time we'll see it. And then in subsequent sols, we'll be transferring more and more of that very detailed engineering data that's kind of the prize of this project and doing even deeper analysis on that. So the helicopter and the MassCam Z don't talk in the sense that the two the two devices on the rover don't talk, but of course, Elsa and our team have been talking a lot about how to synchronize our timing to make sure that, that the MassCam Z gets the images at the right time. So there's human synchronization, but not necessarily rover to heli synchronization. And Elsa and our team have been very excited, and we've been very excited at the great images we've seen from them. Up next, we have Andrea Linfelder from Houston Chronicle. Hi, uh, thank you. This question for uh, Mimi. I was hoping, you know, you could help us understand a little more just why it's hard to fly in the thin Martian atmosphere. Like, I, I get that it has to be lighter and faster, but why exactly? What is it that makes it difficult? Yes, so a rotorcraft, you know, flies by, you know, generating lift, right? And by on Earth, it's by pushing air. So the blades push the air and the lift is generated. So on Mars, where the atmospheric density is so thin, about 1% compared to here, there are less molecules basically to push, right? And so that means that we have to compensate uh, for flying a vehicle. We have to spin so much faster uh, than we do. So if you take a four pound uh, vehicle on Earth, you don't have to spin it, you know, 2400, 2500 RPM that we have to spin on Mars to generate the lift. So that's the first and foremost. Just aerodynamically, it is extremely difficult to generate lift when there isn't enough um, you know, uh, atmospheric elements uh, to, to generate lift from. So, so in fact, that's why a helicopter has never, hasn't been developed to fly on Mars up to now. Because for a vehicle of this kind of capability, right, being able to generate lift, to lift a, a 1.8 kilogram, right, four pounds on Earth kind of vehicle, and in the meantime, to be able to control it, hundreds of, to control the blades hundreds of times per second, measuring with the sensors and calculating the algorithms of the computers and surviving on its own, being able to communicate like uh, Tim was describing, you know, all of that energy, you know, so solar panels, all of it together to be that light. Uh, we just couldn't do it 15, 20 years ago uh, for, for a 1.8 kilogram limit, so. Great, thanks Mimi. Up next, we have Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Good morning um, or afternoon. The, um, I have a question for Mimi. Um, overall, what do you think the chances are of a successful flight and what do you think is the riskiest part of the demo? Sure, um, 
this is definitely a high risk, high reward, uh, as uh, Thomas mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, experiment. So um, probabilities are much higher now. Uh, I think the whole question has been, we knew at launch that it is possible for ingenuity to fly in the atmospheric condition and the terrain that is gonna observe and in the environment from all our mathematical analytical modeling and testing in the chamber that Amy described. Okay, so the confidence is high there because we've done it in simulated environment on our Mars as much as we can. Between now, then and now has been checking back off, you know, the way we did build ingenuity, the parts we selected and the assumptions we made, how good were they? And so far, and I keep knocking on wood because we had to get there first, uh, they've been great. You know, it turned on well in vacuum, space vacuum. To me, you know, we were still holding the breath. Does it work in vacuum? It worked great. After landing, great. Did it deploy and, and did it survive deployment from Perseverance? It did. And the biggest question has been, do we have enough energy? Do we have the solar panel performance and the battery sizing correct? And how, do we estimate how much energy it took to survive the night? We have received check marks for all of them. And the last few solves has been about checking the rotor system. That did the rotor system survive the journey and is it there the way we launched it from Earth? So far, it looks like it because you've, saw, you've seen the 50 RPM spin. And then tonight is the big one. When we spin the full speed uh, on the surface, still while on the surface, and that will ultimately check that this vehicle is there in the way that we launched it. If that is the case, then the uncertainty, the only uncertainty remain the actual environment of Mars. So the winds, and we talked a little bit about it. We've been talking to the meta team, cross-checking the, with the weather. So d depending on the wind, and um, uh, we, in that case, we'll be pretty confident. But uh, again, I want to be stay conservative. We have never let ourselves surprise, you know, celebrate. So uh, really looking forward to uh, Sunday. Great, thanks, Mimi. We have some social questions coming in as well. Um, Aaron on Facebook wants to say hi from his nine-year-old son, Charlie. And Charlie wants to know, do you have a Mars helicopter 2.0 invented? Thomas, would you like to? So, <laughs> hey, hi back. Uh, you know, I have to tell you where I'm thinking about that right now, and, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who's thinking about it. The one thing you need to know is that we're already working on another craft, and it's going to go to this moon called Titan. Titan is actually different than Mars because of the fact that actually if you go close to the, the ground of it, it the pressure is actually higher than the pressure on Earth. So it also is a rotor craft uh, called Dragonfly, by the way. That's what it's called. Go Google it, figure it out. Go, f you know, it will, it will also fly and explore. It's a much heavier type of uh, uh, vehicle. But uh, Mimi, I'm sure you're already thinking about, uh, you know, the 2.0 uh, and, and your team is. Is there anything you wanted to add? Absolutely. Uh, there is an ongoing uh, research uh, with, uh, you know, led by JPL, but part of the team, JPL uh, and Ames uh, Air Environment, has been looking into future larger uh, vehicles. And the, the vision is, you know, we have Ingenuity 1.2 meter diameter, and future vehicles that have been sized are more three meters, three and a half meter diameter, much larger, and in the 10, 15 kilogram class, able to carry payloads, you know, two kilogram level to make, uh, you know, significant exploration. So that kind of research is afoot, and yes, this is all about the future. This is a pathfinder, absolutely. Thank you. Sounds like an exciting future ahead. Up next on the phone lines is Robert Holtz with Wall Street Journal. Hi, I guess this is the question for Mimi or perhaps Tim. Uh, you've said that one of, the, one of the controlling factors for picking the time of the flight on Sunday are the wind conditions that you expect in Jezero Crater based on measurements you've been getting from MEDA, uh, the onboard uh, meteorological sensors. So I wonder if you can tell us, uh, you know, what are the winds? What's the range that you've been getting in the crater? You say that you might encounter winds higher there than you've tested for on Earth. What is the highest you've tested for on Earth? And what does a Martian wind do in terms of uh, flight control challenges that might be different than you'd experience on Earth? The wind, please. Thank you. Sure, um, I can start and then I'm gonna let Amy fill in too on the test. So yes, uh, Martian wind, first of all, impact um, 
the, the dynamics of the vehicle, right? So you, we have a closed loop control system and it's the disturbance that we do model uh, analytically and we like to also test by exposing to actual wind to confirm. And so, so far the meta uh, data is, and this is very initial data because meta team is uh, integrate, uh, calibrating their information. And so based on data, the uncertainty, because it's so early in the game, we have very large uncertainty. So the, the averages that uh, we have expected are, I believe around six meters uh, per second or, or less average, but then you know, you need to add three sigma uncertainty to it because it is a very early part of the calibration. And so if you add three sigma and the uncertainty, it could be high uh, around the 20 meter per second range, uh, or it could be low. I mean, it's both bounding, right? It could be much less than six meters per second. It could be in the 20 meters per second range. Uh, the average is about six meters per second or so. Uh, but we tested our system to 11 meters per second that Amy will describe is an art in itself, but that's for the testing. Now, we also did the simulation under Hobart Grip's uh, you know, team, uh, has simulated the closed loop control uh, with winds up to uh, you know, close to 30 meters per second, and the closed loop control has margin to uh, fight and be resilient uh, towards the higher perturbation than what we were able to test. So. Um, that's the, at Earth, you can only test so much, and our limit has been how to set it up. So, Amy, I'm gonna hand it to, over to you on, Amy was actually in charge of this wind test, so. So we did a wind test as part of our, our uh, battery of tests in that 25-foot space simulator. What we did to generate this wind is we put together a large bank of computer fans. It was actually almost 900 of them. Can you imagine a raid blowing at this helicopter? So we achieved that 11 meters per second that Mimi was talking about. Our goal was at least 10 meters per second when we put this together. So we were able to test the controller against that speed, which I believe is above the average that Mimi uh, quoted, but not necessarily with the three sigma added. Great, and up next is Lisa Grossman with Science News. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, I was wondering about the specific timeline for getting the video and the images back to Earth and back to us. And I was also wondering why there's that checkerboard pattern on the rotor blade. Okay, uh, many people, I'll leave it to Elsa and Tim to answer the timeline and then I can uh, take the checkerboard, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I will start out and um, Tim, you can add some more detail. We will be getting the first video snippets that I described. We're, like I mentioned, we were able to pick about somewhere between six and 10, depending on our um, results tonight. Um, we'll be picking those out. Each of those snippets are two and a half seconds and we have to space them about 20 seconds apart over the range of when we think the flight could happen. So those will come down um, very close to midnight on Monday, California time that is. Um, the images, there will also be about probably just one image pair um, for, from after the flight. We take images before the flight to make sure that we have the, how everything was looking before the flight. Then we take the video during the flight and then after we take a control image, if you will, and then we can blink the before and after together and see, okay, how did those two compare? That's of course been sitting on the surface right now until now, so those have been easy blinks that you've seen with the, with the rotors rotating. That's been the before and after image that we have been taking maybe an hour apart. Um, and then more data will be trickling in over the next days as we can um, get more downlink from Mars um, overnight, especially we have some very big passes with the, with the TGO orbiter. Um, and we are just taking all the downlink we can get from all the orbiters um, so we can get back as much as possible. And Tim, did you wanna add anything to that? No, I think our pattern is similar. We of course are gonna be taking these images during our flight and storing them on the storage that's on the helicopter, but we're gonna be downloading those different images over the course of a few days. As I mentioned earlier, for the flight itself, we're gonna be downlinking one or two of those downward facing images as we come in for a landing. That way we can help figure out exactly where the helicopter landed. 
So that will come down in a similar time frame as the rest of the helicopter performance data on that first SOL. And then on those on the second SOL after, we will be downlinking that color image so that we'll be able to look at that. And then on the on the SOLs after that, there are actually some more of those black and white images that we took uh, actually while we're aloft. Because one of the things we want to do is to validate the algorithm used to detect those features on the ground. So the so the engineering team of the helicopter, the guidance team, can take those images that we took aloft, look at the features, and then look at that high rate telemetry that we took that is actually telling us what features it thought it saw and able to correlate that with the images that we took and then see how well their, their algorithms perform. But it's going to be a multi-SOL operation. And the most important one on that first SOL is that one black and white that will help us localize where the helicopter landed. And uh, to the uh, question on the blade, uh, very absolutely those grids are there. And it all comes from mass constraint. For 1.8 8 kilograms is 1,800 grams. With so many components, every bit mattered, right? So uh, the blades themselves are, I believe, about 35 grams. It's really, really light. They just look big and long, but they're really light. And the way it was built was a foam core in the middle with carbon fiber layup uh, so that we could have both the lightweight but still the strength uh, to be able to push Thin, thin as the atmosphere is, you're still pushing 2,400, 2,500 RPM, right? And so it has to be strong. And also from the controls perspective for modeling and testing that we talk about, you know, to do in the chamber, it had to also be stiff so that we really had a way to confirm our models before we actually even tried a test flight in the chamber. So for stiffness, strength, and lightweight, the carbon fiber layup uh, was used uh, also above the foam and is cross patterned to give it the most strength. So that's the reason for the cross pattern that you're seeing. Instead of going fibers in parallel, the cross pattern really gives additional strength. And uh, Air Environment did a fantastic job you know, building this blade. So first it was carefully designed with the twist core distribution and then fabricated fabulously with these requirements. Thank you. And up next is Alexander Witz with Nature Magazine. Hi, I just want to follow up real briefly on Lisa's question about the timing. Um, there's a difference between images and video downlinking and images and video being released to the public. Do we anticipate getting any images released to the public prior to that 8 a.m. press conference on Monday in California? So, so this is Thomas. I'm going to start and I'm going to kick it over. Uh, our intent is to keep the pipeline open just the way we have in the past. So. So basically, the images as they come down, they will go into the pipeline and they'll, they'll, be, uh, they'll be open. Uh, there may be some technical reasons uh, that something is slightly delayed, and I'll open it up for you uh, to add uh, to that. But uh, the principle is that we're, you know, after the, you know, I hope many will, of you will join us uh, as we uh, on nasa.gov slash live, as we uh, kind of join the team. Uh, and uh, during this historic moment, uh, there will be some images there. Uh, the images will come in, and uh, by the time we do the press conference, uh, the, we'll, uh, you know, we'll pull together uh, the best way we know how, but, uh, but I'm sure others uh, will try themselves with the images that are there. The pipeline will be open, Alex. Go ahead, if anybody wants to add anything. Yes, I'll just add a few snippets to that, which is our team is going to be pouncing on the data as it comes in. You know, we are just looking at as as soon as it comes in, as soon as it starts to hit, in fact, as it comes in from the orbiters, we're already starting to look at it. And of course, our first and foremost um, priority is to make sure everything worked as expected, that the cameras are working, that everything is healthy. We do that every single day. But on this occasion especially, we're going to look for those first images post-flight to also help in the ascertaining of the success of it and then the video snippets that we hope will um, catch part of the flight. Um, so that's the one that comes in right after midnight, and it's always such a precious downlink because, as we call it, it's decisional, which means that it can go into um, decision-making for the next day. And then orbiters, uh, there'll be other orbiter downlinks throughout um, the day on Monday um, to add to the pot, if you will. Um, there is. 
of course, we have to actually collect the zeros and ones and create images. So there's a few minutes of delay um, before it gets to the public website. But um, otherwise, we are just trying to get it out to the public as quickly as possible. So go to the JPL raw images website. And um, I know that there'll also be you know, our science team, other science team um, members, and Justin Mackey at JPL. Um, will be standing by. He's one of our top image, um, he's actually the image scientist and he's one of the top processors of data. He's the one you've always seen when we land, he's the first one to bring up an image. He'll be there um, at the press conference to serve everybody up with the latest images that we have. So there will be images um, very quickly. Um, I can't say the timeline exactly because we will simply process it and give it out to you guys as soon as we can. So if you don't mind, I'll go one more time. And I just want to uh, just ask you all uh, who are excited about these images uh, for patience, uh, in a sense that you know the, the good people that, that you hear talking about it and their entire teams will work at whatever is the, the speed that they can to get this out. But just because of the sheer amount of images, you know, there will be some uh, delays, obviously, but it's not because of uh, any other reason than uh, the team needs to work through it and make the data useful as, as it gets out. So I just want to ask the public uh, for patience as we uh, work through this uh, again uh, during this uh, pandemic period and you know, that, that still uh, at times uh, makes it a little bit harder to get uh, things out. just want to tell you that uh, we, the team, I have been just so proud of what the team has done from the moment. Uh, we have landed on Mars, uh, kind of getting these pipelines uh, open there and uh, and getting uh, so many excited around the entire earth, earth, you know, getting excited working with, uh, with data and trying themselves to find a new, th out new things about Mars. That's right, and I also wanna add actually, your, your comments are reminding me how much we actually enjoy the interaction with the public about this. You know, we're seeing our images go out and immediately people are creating mosaics from the images or they're creating their own enhancements of the images and we really enjoy that. You know, we look at those images as well. We talk about them, hey, did you see so-and-so did, did this? Um, and in a, in a sense, you know, we are immediately sharing our data, our gold from Mars um, with everybody and that's part of the experience for us is that we get to share it. It gives such a, such a perspective to us. You know, we are, we have really cool jobs. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but we are like nose to the grindstone every day working on this. And so when we get to share with the public today and all the times when we send out data, that gives us that perspective, that gives us that connection with the public. And my PI, um, Jim Bell, who used to be the president of the Planetary Society, is hugely supportive and engaged in public outreach. And it's just a part and parcel of our team. So go to our website too, go to the NASA um, Raw Images website. We are starting a, a favorites area of our website um, that we know, hope and know will grow over time. And we've also encouraged input actually from the public to that website. So just like I worked on the Juno mission as well, um, and that's one of the missions that pioneered the, the input of um, public images to the website, the official website. We're doing that with MassCam Z as well. And we just, we want to see what you guys are doing. We want to see how you are um, relating to our data and what you get out of it. So stay in touch. Thank you. And that website they are mentioning is go.nasa.gov slash perseverance dash raw dash images. We will again run it at the end of this broadcast. So you will be able to see this link once more towards the end. But we do have the phone lines up still open. And up next is Jeff Faust with Space News. Hi, question for uh, Mimi. Uh, assuming that this flight uh, Sunday goes um, as planned is successful, uh, how soon do you think you would be ready to perform a second flight? And what is the process to review the data from this first flight and then plan for the second, presumably more ambitious flight. Thanks. Excellent. Yes, the, the cadence uh, between flights uh, will be four days uh, after the first flight 
And then if uh, you know, we are happy with that, we'll go on to three-day cadence. So meaning after the first flight, we're going to let the vehicle have a rest day so that we can again confirm the energy model uh, after its very first flight. So that's a, a different, you know, just for the first flight. And we start, as uh, Tim Cannon mentioned, we start to bring our high rate data back uh, over the two days after that. And that's where our treasure is. And I have to emphasize this. <laughs> it really is about the engineering data as much as we can to confirm our model. So that's when we get our you know, flight sensor, uh, all how, how well do we perform, as well as that icing, those color pictures will come in. So rest after the first flight, rest, and then uh, for the vehicle rest, uh, we won't be. We look at all the data, see how the performance will, and we will be ready to fly the fourth day after the first flight. And, and then after the second flight, uh, then we will just be in three-day cadence. Fly, the next day get the first set of high-rate data, and then the next day after that get the last bit of the high-rate data. And in those uh, three days, uh, two days following, we'll be ready for the third flight, the fourth flight, et cetera. Um, so, uh, oh, in terms of more ambitious flight, absolutely. We will be, we're going, as Tim mentioned, we'll go up to three meters and hover, but in the future ones, we'll go up to five meters, start going laterally, first modestly, and then we'll go on further to, you know, 50 meter out and back. And then once we get to fourth and fifth flight, uh, we'll have fun. We really want to, Thomas, we really want to push our vehicle to the limit. It's not every day that you get to test a rotorcraft and do an experiment on Mars. So after the third flight, uh, just warning, we are going to be very uh, adventurous. Go oh, crazy with it, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that answer, Mimi. And we have a social media question coming in. Tim on Facebook asks, will the weather station on the rover allow or deny the flight if wind is excessive? It's a question for Tim from Tim. <laughs> sure, well, hello, Tim, this is Tim. Nice to meet you. Um, so the meta instrument has its own data set that again follows a path where where they take they take the data and then they downlink it to Earth and the meta team decodes all that data on their own. So the weather on Mars tends to be more or less the same across many SOLs. So when we get a weather report as a team, it's really uh, getting a history of the weather plus those wind predictions that Mimi mentioned. <clears throat> so because it's really these two separate teams processing their data. The weather station on the rover has no decision-making process on the day of the flight to stop or allow the flight. There's no, there's no connection on board the rover where the weather station can tell the helicopter, you can't fly today. So that connection isn't there. It relies on the experts on the ground and both teams to decode the data and come to these reasoned uh, engineering judgments as to whether or not we should fly. Great, thank you, Tim. And we have another social media question. Javi on Facebook asks, what is the speed of sound on Mars and can the tip of the Ingenuity blades exceed the speed? Uh, Amy? Do, yeah, uh, it, we are going to be flying at uh, about 0.6 Mach on, on, on Mars. And I've done this math before, but I don't remember the number, uh, Thomas, if you remember, but if you look up, just calculate, but it will be about 0.6 0.6, the speed of sound, is how the tip speed will be. And so um, you, you can Google it. I'm sorry, I have looked it up, and I just don't remember the number. So yes, please look it up. 0.6 mark on Mars. Good question. Yeah. Well, and, and yes, the entire design for the how fast, you know, the upper limit on how fast we can uh, spin, right, in, calculate, in designing the entire system, we took the speed of sound uh, at Mars into account. Thanks, Mimi. We'll work on getting you those exact numbers. <laughs> Up next on the phone line is Matt Kaplan from Planetary Radio. Hi, everyone. Thank you for this. Really thrilled. Looking forward to Sunday. Um, going back to uh, Thomas's comment about Dragonfly, that uh, maybe Mars and Titan don't have a lot in common, but uh, Mimi, I'm wondering if uh, you are trading information uh, with those folks, and uh, I'm sure they have high hopes for your success. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, Michael Rickskevich, uh, who leads the space division in APL, where um, uh, D Dragonfly is being developed, uh, Michael Rickskevich was our independent review team chair throughout the lifetime of uh, Ingenuity um, Mars helicopter development over the years. So, uh, yes, and, you know, while um, uh, Dragonfly is flying in the thicker 
atmosphere, right? So it's a different kind of vehicle, it's heavier. Uh, at Mars, it's all about being light uh, and you know, more autonomous and it's, it's, it's a different kind of challenge. However, uh, where we can uh, learn from each other is uh, with the, being the first rotorcraft in a flying vehicle on another planet or in, in the case, you know, the, at around a moon with atmosphere, but not at Earth. It has been a challenge that Amy uh, described uh, and I think, and described more. How do you test this vehicle, right? So you have the fundamental models. Yes, you spin, you generate lift and control fast enough you can fly. Easier said than done, right? How do we go about testing it? And we've had incremental uh, steps in how do you spin it? How do you, do, you know, measure the force? Check the torque cancellation. I think that methodology that we've had to invent in parallel to inventing a first aerial vehicle for a planetary exploration, uh, that will be very much applicable. And uh, Michael Rixkevich uh, uh, is very familiar and I'm sure we'll be interacting further as they go into the VNV phase. We've had initial conversations as well. Thank you. And up next on the phone lines is Dan Sweet from Rotor Magazine. Uh, good afternoon. I appreciate the enthusiasm each of you are showing for, for your segments of the mission. I can't even imagine what this is like for you. My question is for Mimi, Tim, or Amy. Um, you've developed some pretty interesting new technology for ingenuity, including the high altitude flight, the high rotor speed, and the feature tracking camera for navigation. How do you anticipate this technology might translate to advanced air mobility or, or urban air mobility flight that's currently being developed uh, here on Earth? Sure. Um, well, um, actually, this is a great question for ARMD's uh, Revolutionary Vertical Lift Technology Program uh, Manager, uh, Susan Gordon. Of course, she's not here, but. Um, ARMD uh, really participated in the fundamental, you know, flying in a high altitude, this, uh, you know, very, very thin atmosphere and uh, increment. And, and one of the overlap on Earth would be for high altitude flight. But, I mean, Susan would be able to answer this question. You know, for example, flying in Himalayas, right? We can't, we can't get above uh, certain heights. And so introducing this kind of in a very thin, uh, you know, high, high mark, number, right, operation in this very thin atmosphere, that regime. So it would be applicable to very high altitude applications. Uh, that would be one example. Uh, but really, uh, this is a great answer for ARMD. Uh, yeah, I think that yeah. they, they should really answer that. But I just want to tell you, uh, I've been dreaming about a movie taken of one of these amazingly high mountains that has been so many stories have been about and actually seeing that that kind of drone flying up that cliff. You know, I just, I've been dreaming about this and, and, uh, and I'm sure there's entrepreneurs, innovators out there who are thinking about this uh, together with, of course, the, the work that we're doing within the government. You know, they, once this test, you know, uh, hopefully is successful there, there are new applications that are there uh, also here on earth, applications that we need to think of now, applications that nobody else really made a reality as of yet. All right, thank you so much for all your questions. We unfortunately can't answer all the media questions on air. For those of you with additional questions, please call JPL's digital news and media office. We'll also continue to answer social media questions online. And thank you all for all your questions coming in. And thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Ingenuity will attempt its first powered controlled flight no earlier than April 11th. If the helicopter flies on April 11th, a live stream where you can watch Ingenuity engineers analyze their first data from that test flight, it will begin at 12.30 a.m. Pacific time on April 12th, an early morning there. For the latest helicopter schedule, visit go.nasa.gov ingenuity. There's a watch online section there where you can get broadcast updates. And to learn more about the Perseverance rover, visit mars.nasa.gov slash perseverance. And like Thomas and Elsa mentioned before, for raw images from the Perseverance rover, visit go.nasa.gov slash perseverance dash raw dash images. Now, the sheer volume of images coming down after the first flight, it's going to take time to come through to the public website. They will come down, but we ask that you be patient 
as they load throughout the day. And if you're on social media, join the conversation about the helicopter by following at NASA JPL and use the hashtag Mars Helicopter. Thanks for watching. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, we are ready for the event. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Houston ACR, we have you loud and clear. The Space Institute at Rice University engages in research, technology development, and education. With colleagues at Scottish Enterprise and the Wyakiel Space Society, we have brought together students from Houston, Scotland, and Ecuador who are excited to talk to the International Space Station and for the collaboration among our schools going forward. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce the Right Honorable Nicola Sturgeon, MSP, First Minister of Scotland, for some opening remarks. I want to say hello to all of the young people who are taking part in this uplink. I'm very grateful to the Rice Space Institute, NASA and all of the other partners who've helped make it possible. Today, you all have a chance to hear directly from the crew of Expedition 64 about the research they're carrying out and about what it's like for people from different countries to work together for the common good. It's a brilliant opportunity and I hope you find it inspiring. And I know you'll all want to get on with the questions straight away. So let's move on to the first one. Hello, my name is Cameron Kelman. I'm age 15 and I'm a student at Bathgate Academy in Scotland. My question for NASA is, how do you mentally and physically prepare for a long-term space mission? Thank you. Hey, that is an excellent question because it does take a lot of preparation to get ready for a space flight. On the mental side, I don't know. You just really have to be ready to go. You have to know that you're going to be gone for your friends and family for at least six months, usually longer than that because we go into quarantine ahead of time. So um, you just need to be ready, and everybody prepares for that differently. Physically, you've got to be in shape to be able to do spacewalks, to be able to take the loads of launching and landing. And so we actually work with athletic trainers before we leave uh, Earth to make sure we're in the best physical shape we can be before we get up here. 
Hello, my name is Emilia Franco. I am 14 years old. It's a privilege to ask this question in representation of my school, Unidad Educativa Javier, in Guayaquil, Ecuador. Once you have looked at our planet from space, what do you think about humanity's effort to live a sustainable life? Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. That is a wonderful question, and we're really excited to be speaking to you as well. Our planet certainly is beautiful. Um, we can see it. We have some, some windows here in an area called the cupola, and we're pretty busy during the workday, but when we get a chance, we like to look down. Often this is maybe at night uh, after all of our all of our duties are done and we see the earth is such a beautiful and peaceful place but we're also very struck by how fragile it is there's just a very thin atmosphere um, the planet looks like it's this beautiful bright planet but it's alone it's it's got uh, really the dark cold of space surrounding it and so I think it helps us think a lot more carefully about this is the only place that we've got. This is where humanity lives. And we do get a strong sense that we need to take very good care of it. And we're interconnected and it is a fragile oasis. Hi, my name is Megan and my question goes out to any and all astronauts. How does food preparation differ in outer space and are there any extra measures you need to take in order to ensure proper nutrition? Oh, that is a great question, Megan. Um, nutrition is important, and you are absolutely right. Nutrition is important on the ground, and it's very important in space, too, because what we eat can affect how healthy we can remain up here. While we're in space, we are constantly losing bone density, so we need a way to keep our bones strong. Some of that's through exercise. A lot of that's through nutrition. So how do we do it? Well, we've got teams of people on the ground that actually prepare all our food for us and send it up to the space station. So we depend on them to make sure that our food is nutritious nutritionally sound uh, so we uh, can eat it up here. Preparing food up here is pretty simple. We just heat it up and eat it. Hi, my name is Leah Mowbray and I attend Lockhill Academy in Scotland and my question is after completing a space mission and